Le Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here uh, for Dr. Luis Pineda and the uh, Colombian Association. La Asociación Colombiana por el And what I wanted to do in the next, uh, en los próximos, uh, en la próxima hora, no, 20 minutos, les prometo que no es una hora, es hablarles sobre nuevos conceptos relacionados con la enfermedad por reflujo gastroesofágico refractario. So, just want to make sure that we understand the definition of uh, refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease. The problem is that we have two bueno, issues. One issue is we have what we call refractory heartburn, and then we have refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease. And there is a little bit difference, a little change in the definition when it comes to each one of them. So, if, for example, uh, when we look at the definition of refractory heartburn, we're talking about symptoms that are not not responding to a stable double dose of a PPI during a treatment period of at least 12 weeks, but if you want to do uh, refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease, you have to add that these are symptoms that are caused by the reflux of gastric content. Now, we have to understand that refractory GERD is a patient-driven phenomenon. And I mentioned it each time in my presentation because I see these patients in my practice on a regular basis. What drives one patient to seek medical attention may not drive another. So that's very important to understand that concept. Okay. Bueno, entonces, um, when we look at the, miramos, uh, how common the epidemiology the of uh, refractory uh, GERD, then when you look at randomized trials, it's about 30% of the patients that take PPI once a day in this study, by the way. It wasn't twice a day, but once a day in this study. And in uh, observational studies, it can go up to 45%. So we're looking at a very common problem. Next slide, please. So, Again, going back to the topic of my presentation, we're looking here at two scenarios. So let's first cover the first scenario. This is the patient with documented gastroesophageal reflux disease who is not responsive to PPI, who we call a true refractory GERD. So, first of all, when you look at this patient, I wanted to make sure that you all understand that there is no PPI that patient cannot outdo. Um, if you eat this meal every night, you will have, and you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, there's likely you're going to have symptoms. Now, it's very also Ahora, important to understand where these patients are coming from. And we're talking now uh, about patients that have gastroesophageal reflux disease who fail treatment. Uh, they're coming from all three phenotypes of gastroesophageal reflux disease, Barrett's esophagus, erosive esophagitis, and non-erosive reflux disease. But there's no question that most of them come from the non-erosive reflux disease, as was already mentioned by Dr. David Pura. It could be up to 40 to 50 percent of these patients that will fail PPI once a day, let alone twice a day. Now, when it comes to GERD patients, the main thing that we have to look at in relation to non-respond to PPI treatment is compliance. It's very important to understand that 
es muy importante entender que muchos de los pacientes simplemente no cumplen, o quieren o no. Los estudios han demostrado que a las cuatro semanas 50% de estos no cumplen y toman los medicamentos. Bueno, a demanda, a los tres meses 70% ya no cumplen y no toman el medicamento regularmente. Now you add this to the picture, Ahora, si which is all this information that is out there <coughs> about how bad PPIs are, then you can PPIs. also understand that patients become even more non-compliant in the last few years. And I've seen many, 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 many of my patients started to take themselves off once in a while uh, of PPI because they are concerned uh, about these long-term complications. Then there is adherence to proper timing. Again, something that was also mentioned by Dr. David Pure. When you look at many of our patients, they don't take it correctly. Even though they take it on a regular basis, they just don't take it correctly. In this study, for example, they looked at 100 patients, and they found out that none of them was taking it properly. It's half an hour before a meal. Uh, the most favorite comidas, approach ejemplo, was taking it more than 60 minutes before a meal or taking it after a meal or the, the, o the other one which is very favorite by the way amongst my patients is taking it at bedtime. A Now it's also important to understand that, that proper timing is also determined by who gave you the medication. This is a study that actually came from our este department and where they looked at uh, patients' uh, uh, optimal dosing based on how they receive their medication. So proper adherence to timing. And they found out that if the patient got the medication over the counter, the likelihood that they took it correctly was only 39%. If a primary care physician gave it to them, then most of them don't even explain the patients how to take the PPIs. So correctly for the 7%. The GI. Correcto, Ducks. 47%. Y los gastroenterólogos sí eran los que les daban how, la mejor información uh, en cuanto a cómo tomarlos en forma apropiada. Though, Sin embargo, el US, problema, I, por lo menos en Estados Unidos, y me imagino Colombia, que también es en Colombia, most of those la mayoría de los dosis que tienen que ver con los pacientes con enfermedad con reflujo gastroesofágico son médicos de atención primaria y no gastroenterólogos. Now, I want to show you this very busy management algorithm. Bueno, algoritmo el issue de gastroenterología es going to be a supplement that will be dedicated to gastroesophageal reflux disease. And these papers, by the way, are already available for you, although in a raw form. Now, this is a paper that I wrote with Dr. Guayali on the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And this is what I wanted to introduce you. Because this paper incorporates some of the new information that came from Rome 4, as well as new information from recent studies in patients who failed PPI treatment. It's very important that we will understand another concept, which is introduced in this management algorithm. If you have patients that failed PPI once a day, una vez al día, the next step entonces el siguiente paso es lo que nosotros llamamos optimización de los IVPs, bueno, algo reconocido por todas las guías de la sociedad. Y estos son simples pasos sencillos, familiar with these simple steps that one can take can take in order to optimize their PPI. Uh, consumption, and that includes lifestyle modifications, especially nighttime precautions, for example, not taking a PPI, not eating at least three hours no comer before you go to sleep, elevating the head of the bed, uh, uh, avoiding the right decubitus position, or turn off the light and go to sleep when you go to bed. Improve compliance, ensure proper dosing time. The other thing you can take the standard dose of the PPI, especially if patients have daytime and nighttime symptoms, and split the dose. If uh, half, a week, half an hour before breakfast and half an hour before breakfast, if one PPI doesn't work, you can switch to another, or you can take instead of doubling the PPI dose, which many of the patients are concerned about in these days, then one maybe can add another anti-reflux medication. Otro medicamento antirreflujo y siempre, siempre considerar las comorbilidades psicológicas en muchos de los pacientes que fallaron los PPI dos veces al día. Yo sí creo que muchas veces las comorbilidades psicológicas han 
dirigido los so that brings us to move to the second scenario we have under this topic. And this is the patient with heartburn who is not responsive to PPI, but who is not documented GERD in the past. So it could be either true refractory GERD or at the end of the day we're talking about some type of a functional esophageal disorder. Now, when you look at these four disorders Cuando that are mentioned at the bottom, all of them have heartburn as the main manifestation, as the predominant symptom. On the left side, you have two GERD-related phenotypes, erosive esophagitis and non-erosive reflux disease. On the right side, you have two functional esophageal disorders, which is reflux and hypersensitivity and functional As you move from the GERD to the functional esophageal disorders, you see that acid exposure plays a lesser role. And esophageal hypersensitivity plays a more important role. And that's very important to understand. Now, we already Ahora, suspected that when it came to patients who failed PPI twice a day, that we are likely dealing with esophageal hypersensitivity as an underlying mechanism by early studies. This is, for example, a study that we did uh, about eight years ago. And in this study, we took patients that failed PPI once a day and compared them to patients who were successfully treated with a PPI once a day. And we did dual pH and Bilitec studies. Allows us to assess bilitec. And then we look at the reflux characteristics of these two groups, two groups and we compare them. And we found out that there was no difference. There was no difference in the reflux characteristics between those that were successfully treated with PPI once a day versus those who were not successfully treated with PPI once a day, suggesting that the esophageal hypersensitivity is an important mechanism behind a lot of these patients. Here is another study that was published later from Leuven. Uh, again, looking this time at patients who were not responsive to PPI once a day versus those that were partially responsive. So they did demonstrate some response to PPI, but it wasn't satisfactory to the patient. They found out that there was no difference in the rate of acid reflux, no difference in the pH of acid pocket between the two groups, no difference in position of the acid pocket, no difference of permeability of the mucosa. None of them was different between the two groups. What they did when they did balloon distension in the esophagus in these patients, either the distal or proximal esophagus, they noticed that from pain perception threshold there was a shift in the left, meaning patients who were partial responders had lower perception thresholds for pain. Umbrales más bajos de percepción del dolor. So that brings us to the way we look at patients who fail PPI twice a day. Dos veces al día. And in the past, especially when we introduced the PHP that helped us to evaluate these patients, we raised the concept that maybe we're dealing with residual reflux as an important mechanism, either in the form of non-acidic or acidic reflux. O acidic el reflujo. And even recent management algorithms suggest that that's probably the case in many of these patients. And as a result, they propose management algorithms to address reflux. And you can look at the bottom. So, for example, surgery, uh, inhibitors, uh, LES inhibitors, as well as others. However, embargo, what we're going to argue is that with the introduction of the Rome 4 criteria and with the introduction of a new functional esophageal disorder, which is reflux hypersensitivity, it appears today that if you have patients who fail PPI twice a day, that the vast majority of these patients will have a functional esophageal disorder, either functional heartburn or now, what is the definition of functional harboring based on Rome 4 definition? You can see it's burning, retrosternal discomfort or pain, no symptom relief, despite optimal anti-secretory therapy, evidence, absence of evidence that GERD uh, or eosinophilic esophagitis are the underlying cause, and absence of major esophageal motor disorder. And these are the additional criteria.
Reflux hypersensitivity was a new functional esophageal disorder that was introduced by ROM4 in 2016, defined as retrosternal symptom, including heartburn and chest pain, normal endoscopy and absence of evidence that EOE or AOE is the cause of symptoms, absence of a major esophageal motor disorder, and evidence of triggering of symptoms by reflux events despite normal acid exposure on pH or pH impedance monitoring, and that response to anti-secretory therapy does not exclude the diagnosis. And these are the criteria. Now, why reflux hypersensitivity was introduced as a new underlying, as a new functional esophageal disorder? Because, first of all, from a pathophysiological point of view, it does demonstrate that only physiological amounts of reflux trigger symptoms, and it's likely that esophageal hypersensitivity is the main driving mechanism for symptoms in this patient population. The therapy for these patients should always consider uh, therapy Therapies that focus on esophageal hypersensitivity. And uh, an important role in refractory girl because it requires a more targeted treatment. Now, if you look at one of the old studies that suggested that residual reflux in the one of the most important underlying causes for refractory heartburn, and if you look back at this study, you will find out that many of the patients that had residual reflux, either non acidic or acidic, it was in the context of normal esophageal acid exposure. And so as a result, they fall under the category of reflux hypersensitivity. Now, when you look again at this study, now you find out that more than 90% of the patients in this study had some type of a functional esophageal disorder. This is a study that actually looks specifically into this question, where they took patients who failed PPI twice a day, and they evaluated them, and they found out that 55 percent of them had uh, functional heartburn and that 36 percent of them had reflux hypersensitivity, again suggesting more than 90 percent have functional esophageal disorder. This is another study looking at patients who failed PPI twice a day when they were studied on or off PPI con o sin PPIs, pero pueden ver que casi un 30 por ciento tenían hipersensibilidad de flujo. Así que esto es un trastorno muy común. Y la hipersensibilidad podría ser, como pueden ver ustedes, a un reflujo acídico, debilmente tanto acídico o acídico alone. So what do I try to tell you is that over 90% of the patients who failed PPI twice daily had either functional heartburn or reflux hypersensitivity, two functional esophageal disorders. And if you go back to the management algorithm and you have those patients that failed PPI twice a day and you work them out with impedance, with a... Uh, uh, re uh, reflux testing, and then you do and you do endoscopy with biopsies, all negative, and you do manometry, and there's no evidence of a major motor disorder, then you will end up with a very small group of patients that still have very, very small on the left side, but you will also end up with those that have reflux hypersensitivity, and this is how you potentially approach them, or you will end up with those va a terminar con aquellos que tienen pirosis funcional y esto es la forma como se abordan. Muchas gracias por su atención.